Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. Thank you once again for coming for this session today, the second session of the Fundamentals of Organizing and Writing Academic uh, Research Papers. I'm sure some of you uh, have joined us uh, last week, uh, the two weeks uh, before, and I hope you have got access to the recording and the presentation slide of the last session. We have sent it out to all those who have registered. Those of you who have missed the first session and, and all who have not registered, please feel free to contact us if you need the links. So, uh, so let me uh, quickly uh, do the first part of the presentation today. So as I've said uh, in the previous session, the session today is firstly is recorded. Okay, uh, all your mics are uh, muted currently, so you cannot unmute yourself, uh, but you can unmute uh, if you can raise your e hand at the end of the session, and we can allow you to speak or put in your question uh, in the chat, and we can actually come back to the question at the end of the session. As I mentioned to you before, the, this session uh, is organized uh, with the aim to provide an overview of the fundamentals of uh, organizing and writing quality uh, academic research papers. So uh, it is designed for all staff, okay, students, and also to anyone. So this is actually open to even the general public who is interested in the academic research papers. When I say academic research papers, this can include journal articles, book chapters, uh, conference papers, and anything uh, similar to that. So, uh, so this session will give you a broad overview of uh, some of the fundamentals that, is, that you need to know when you are preparing an academic research papers. So this presentation also can be used for academic staff uh, who would like to use uh, some of the fundamentals that we are teaching here to guide your own students. So please feel free to use the recording, to use the slides. It is very much available for you. So over the next uh, uh, nine lessons, uh, we are going to be covering quite a bit of things here. Uh, if you see the first lesson uh, two weeks ago, we have covered on choosing a topic. How do you uh, select your topic? How do you narrow your topic? How you broaden your topic? Uh, so this was discussed in, in details by Prof. Brian Imri, myself, and also uh, Ms. Fairo Nizan. So today's lesson is very much going to be focusing on preparing to write. How do you prepare yourself before you start writing, which is, going, which is what we're going to be covering uh, from 11th March onwards, the, the breakdown of the important section in any typical publication. For our session here, three of us are going to facilitate this session. We have Professor Dr. Brian Imri, who is the CEO of District College and also an adjunct professor at Wawasan Open University. He will handle the first part of the discussion. And then I will take over the second part. I am currently the president of uh, District College and also uh, adjunct with uh, Wawasan. And then we also have uh, Ms. Uh, Fairo Niza, who is the chief librarian uh, at District College uh, Penang. So for our session today, uh, preparing to write, there's a few important things that we're going to be discussing. The first part, Prof. Brian is going to talk to you about uh, what are the things that you need to think about before you even begin writing, okay? And then trying to understand the fundamentals of what academic writing is all about. So he's going to do that quick introduction before I take over uh, to talk to you about step-by-step uh, step in terms of choosing your title, developing an outline, and then how do you start structuring the paragraphs and organize them, okay? And then Ms. Fairun Nizan will actually talk about some of the library support uh, that, uh, that you can uh, use in terms of uh, preparing, in terms of trying to come up with your paper. So what help that the library can actually provide to you. So now I will hand over to Prof. Brian Imri uh, to take you through on, on the first part of the presentation today. So over to you, Brian. Brian, you can unmute yourself. Uh, thank you, Prof. Vic. Um, I, I think this is a, a really good topic. Um, Brian? I am unmuted. Yeah. Again, problem. 
I'm talking, you cannot hear me. Hello? Yep, okay, we hear you. Okay, but I can't see anything on my screen. Uh, okay. I know why I sometimes have a problem with the, the sound, so. Okay, hold on, hold on. Uh, let me unshare and reshare it again. Uh, yeah, while you're doing that, let me just go ahead. I think this is a yeah. really uh, good topic. I think um, in the first slide here, it starts out with what is really a human condition? We have limited time in our lives, right? You'll be balancing uh, your, your work commitments, your sporting commitments, your family commitments, right? Uh, and other, other personal duties, and, and, and uh, as well as teaching, of course, and research. So, so it can, can sometimes be a little bit of a challenge to bring all of those things into order. So some of the principles we, uh, I'm gonna share here apply not just to your research endeavor, but also to your general life and particularly your work life. Um, so it's, yes, it's, it's, uh, it is true that we all have finite time, but I don't think it's a matter of you don't have time for research. It's a matter of prioritizing the time that you have, even if it's little, and then making uh, small steps and then, and then gradually bigger steps in your research journey. Um, and you, so, so on the left, you see the challenges. The solution uh, that on the right there is what, one solution I found that works is to block off time. In fact, I've, I've also found lately uh, my, my iPhone's reminding me, it also makes, and I don't, don't know if you get these reminders on your Outlook, that, uh, that uh, would I like to have um, blocked out thinking time? And I think that's a really good thing to do. Not just to do with research, but thinking about uh, various projects you have in your life. Maybe it's maybe to develop your teaching, maybe it's you, you're gonna get married, and waiting for coming, or whether it's your research, right? And keeping a and, and the next thing is maybe you you think you're lacking ideas in terms of what research you could do, or how to approach a writing paper. For me, um, I honestly find that my my best time to think is first thing in the morning, and it often happens in an unstructured way in the shower. I don't know why that is. I've previously joked that I should get a shower installed in my office. <laughs> um, but it's that, that, it's, that, it's that time when I somehow I'm, I'm just free to think and no one else is bothering me. There's no, there's no kid crying in there. There's, there's no other distraction. It's just me and my thoughts. Um, maybe for you, it's, it's walk, going for a walk and walking through um, uh, the forest somewhere, finding that, that time when it's just... You can focus on something that also sometimes happens to me and you'll find i know many of the heads of schools head of departments find i end up calling them when i'm walking because i have a thought and i and then i, and I give them a call so it's a so whatever works for you you need to just discover what it is and then do it in a more structured manner point three you're not confident or, or, or with research methodologies this is a very common one which actually which actually can create some fear, which is point five, we'll get to in a second, but it creates some fear of even starting, right? And, and the thing is, there's a whole lot of resources available for, uh, um, to you, right? You can, of course, uh, be a self-starter and go online and, and all sorts of YouTube videos and so on. But actually, uh, if you're working for a college, so the, the OWU, um, um, you can actually, uh, speak to your respective head and they will support you i'm, sh I'm sure uh, whether able in terms of um uh, building into your kpi for the year um various research that might be beneficial to you for no good reason right um but you know there's there's, there's all the time there's follow -up, online even free seminars being run if you're doing if you're a research student maybe i'm doing a master's for research or a PhD, USM uh, runs a whole, whole range of uh, uh, um, training. And indeed, this is an example of online resource. Later on, we will touch on methodologies a little uh, in a broad sense, right? And uh, 
And the next challenge here is lack of research resources. It's also something uh, that's often uh, talked about. Firstly, okay, um, you can actually um, get a whole range of resources from within this institution. Uh, WOU and DISTED have quite a substantive set of online resources, right? But you can also um, pay to become a member of public universities and access that way. Um, um, and both these institutions also have the access to do interlibrary loan from offshore. So an article maybe you, you, you couldn't get in Malaysia, but it's very rare that happens. Uh, but Nizan, I'm sure she can comment more upon that and support you guys in the journey. In terms of um, access to other resources other than library resources, uh, private institutions tend to have more modest um, laboratory um, access, okay, or uh, uh, facilities. Uh, what I found that worked previously other other institutions is apply for grant funding, right, and build into your grant funding application uh, an, uh, an amount whereby you can pay to access either a lab facility in the public university sector or in, in, uh, in a company, uh, so it might be an engineering facility or something, whatever you, is appropriate for your research. That works, um, and, uh, and I've seen many uh, good research come from that sort of approach. Right? So it's a little bit of a, a gathering of resources, but it's possible. I touched before on fear of failing, and uh, that is something which is, an, again, a na another natural human condition, right? You're not alone. We've all had to start somewhere, right? And we all have other hurdles in front of us with a degree of fear. So just, it's just a matter of how much fear we have, right? Um, and I, I think even you know, as for those of you who are lecturers, you know that to some degree, there's an element of fear even when you do your teaching, right? Or when maybe uh, profit comes and observes your teaching maybe in the future. This is, there's a health, it's actually not, oh, sorry, it is healthy to have a certain degree of fear to push us along, but we don't want it overwhelming us. So how do you, how do you actually overcome that? I have found the best thing to do is, uh, in, uh, in the early start of my career particularly, is to work in a research group, right? And, or to, or, to alternatively, if you're working as an individual, present your research to a group of, of, of researchers, right? So that's a scary thing to do, but you will find almost without exception, all right, that they will support you, they will suggest uh, alternative ways to do it, and you'll come away built up and pointed in the right direction. If you are a research student doing uh, a master's or PhD, take every opportunity to go to colloquium, which is basically the same sort of thing. It's a formalized uh, way of sharing your research and getting feedback. And that will help overcome your fear of uh, procrastination, in other words, being, being lazy, finding it difficult to get started. Um, we'll, we'll touch more on this in the next slide, but essentially you need a structured way to order your work, okay? And, be, and to be accountable to yourself and others. But I'll talk about that on the next slide. And seven, uh, it's quite challenging to find a, a place to work. I think many of you have, have struggled during the pandemic, whether you're working or study, um, and you found your own solutions. But uh, one possible solution is using the library. You can book a room in the library uh, or just simply go and study the library, turn off your phone and focus on uh, your research. I, I mentioned that, you know, how important it is to structure your time, okay? Whether you're and to be accountable to yourself and to others. One of the things I, uh, I used to joke about when I was doing my master's and PhD research is that uh, a research degree student become adept at uh, supervisor avoidance behavior uh, when, we're, when we're behind in our deadlines. Um, you may have experienced that too, and, and uh, um, it's, you know, it's, it's okay. You need to cut yourself some slack, but it is good to have some sort of deadline self-imposed so you keep pushing forward and uh, uh there's a technique which i think many of you are available uh, aware of with a gantt chart where you have a, a range of activities within a within a, a timeline 
um, to enable you to achieve the project, in this case, a research paper in the shortest possible period of time. Uh, when you're sitting in establishing this, make sure it's realistic, all right? And it actually aligns with the desired outcome. Sometimes you will have a deadline if it's an assignment. Other times there's a deadline for a special issue of a journal. journal. You start at that point and then you work backwards in your calendar, okay? Being a little bit generous at the time and the, in the in, uh, reflection about what else is happening in your life, but also being generous in your time in respect to where you know your weaknesses are, all right? Um, so, and so if your weakness is in writing up, give yourself some more time. All right, so be realistic with them and then stick to it. All right, um, okay, I, I'll, just, I'll move on to the next. Uh, you can read to the data. The next, the next slide, slide is about academic writing style. You need to write for your audience, right? And so, the first thing you should do when you decide uh, you're going to write, right at the beginning, you, if you're writing a research paper, you should, be, you should be writing for a specific journal. Don't just write a paper and then decide the yeah, other. Write for a particular journal. Okay. Have a look at what their their maximum page length is. Have a look at the structure that they desire. They do they do vary somewhat. And then you also can look at their style, and, and that will differ depending on who their audience, who actually reads that particular journal or other um, outlet. Right, and that will guide the particular expression and and and, uh, and and style of communication. It is, however, I remind you, a research paper, so don't be flippant uh, or or casual in your communication. It needs to be clear, concise, and and uh, it come back to and it will never never vary from the point objective of the paper. It should um, be delivered in the third person rather than saying, I did this. You can say within this research endeavor, it was it was determined that, for example, of, of you know, you, you, you're talking in the third in the third person. Right? Academic writing is all about you communicating in the clearest possible ways quite complex ideas. To who? To a, to a range of scholarly experts, right? So don't. Um, you, but so in this process, you do not have to go through and define every term. They're not stupid, okay? But but it, where it's a particularly new methodology, something you may have to expound upon it, right? The next thing is the things to avoid, all right? Um, I want you to. Um, well, personally, I want to start off saying that I personally hate when I, when I see a research paper which says things such as I believe or uses the word proves, okay? Those are such dangerous words to use. I mean, believes is varying out of the world of scientific realm of, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's varying into religion, okay, a, a personal belief, all right? Uh, what we're writing here is a research paper, whether you're from uh, the social sciences or, uh, or from what we typically call as the, as, as the sciences, um, they're both using a scientific method, all right? So there must be a body of evidence, okay, and, and evidence-informed write-up. Okay. Um, so don't use the word proves unless you can absolutely prove something. And I would, if you go back to philosophy of science, it's very rare you can actually absolutely prove something. Okay, so try not to use the word. But uh, in line with being uh, using a third person, try not to use uh, uh, personal uh, nouns, um, try to be more formal rather than informal, so avoiding slang, being more concise. Um, you will find increasingly Microsoft Word actually uh, helps you to avoid redundancy, all right? Um, and uh, along with being precise, avoid some of these phrases listed here, they, we. Um, uh, you should avoid 
but it is it is maybe in a paper you might use it once at the most using numbers and lists of things all right it should be well structured paragraphs i think the writing style our prophet's going to touch up on the minute so i wouldn't want to get into how to structure a paragraph right now but it must be well thought through right? um now your writing style will be somewhat uh determined by your style of your methodology or what methodology you've got a, a quantitative paper all right is quite different than a qualitative paper and writer so while it is true you should avoid relating your personal experiences by and large all right uh, there may at times be an opportunity to do that for qualitative paper but the general rule is don't do it um, and then finally, okay, the next page. Okay, so right, um, of course, uh, you need to use impeccable grammar, right? A, a grammar, put this way, find a friend who you can partner with and you can read each other's work, all right? Um, you can, of course, uh, employ someone to check, uh, an editor to check your work. Use reference um, tools to also inform the, your choice of word. But while we're on this, in terms of um, referencing, all right, um, I strongly suggest you use EndNote or Mandalay or some other uh, referencing tool to build up your own uh, body of literature that you can actually uh, take with you as you advance your career. Okay, you should become a specialist in some area rather than a generalist of many. Um, I typically find um, that I'm, I make several drafts, um, so uh, I, I might make up to four or five drafts of a paper where I, I make a draft, I set it aside, I go away and do another project, I come back, all right, um, and uh, I find that, that the space between uh, writing a draft and coming back and, and uh, and reviewing it is very valuable, right? So I often find that uh, it's come from a different perspective uh, with the space of time. Read your paper out loud, okay? Get someone else to read the paper and you will also get uh, a different perspective. All right, just a few hints there for you um, in terms of writing. Uh, I personally am somewhat keen when writing to be a perfectionist. I drive myself nuts. You might be more of a a generalist and just put everything down and then tidy up later. So I write slowly and I, I, I curate a sentence and then I recurate a sentence and go on. Whatever your style is, it's okay, right? Um, but you, at the end of the day, you must arrive at a point where you've got a, a well-polished uh, write-up, highly structured, which is appropriate for your audience. Okay, that's what I have to say. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Brian, for starting off the presentation today. Uh, so I'm going to follow through where Brian left, left off in terms of uh, how do you structure the whole paper, the title, the outlining, and then coming to the paragraph. So the title, if you look at it in any academic research paper, the title summarizes the main uh, idea or ideas of your study. So a good title uh, will contain the fewest possible words that uh, adequately uh, describe the contents or purpose of your research. So by just looking at your title, you should be able to judge what is this paper all about. So the title should be fully explanatory. Uh, it is a concise statement of the main topic. Okay. And, and, and it also identifies all the variables that is going to be discussed and investigated uh, in the paper. So the title is used normally, why is it important? Because it is used normally for, for abstracting and indexing purpose. So if your paper title is poorly written, uh, the, the indexing will not be done properly. And as a result, no one can find your paper. Okay, even if you put it in Google, they cannot locate your paper because it's in the, the title is poorly written. Maybe the content is good, but when you have a weak title, you can never find a particular paper.
paper. So you need to know whether the title is too long with too much of info or is it precise enough? So it has to be well balanced to ensure that the information is complete. You should avoid using uh, abbreviation uh, in titles because don't assume that everyone understand what this abbreviation is all about. Don't use any abbreviation in a title. So a good title will normally be very precise. Okay, although I, I put here about 12 words, but it's this plus or minus, not too long and not uh, too short. And sometimes even the title can have two parts of the title. You have the title and then you also have a subtitle. Okay, so, so this is another way of expanding slightly your title. So uh, the subtitle is important because it explains uh, or provides additional context for the title, okay? So this is, is important because it will give you more info that is required. If you see the, the screen here, one of my publication uh, that was published some time back, I have a title, Redefining Rural Tourism in Malaysia. And then the subtitle is a conceptual perspective. So it immediately the people understand, okay, what are you talking about in this paper? It's a conceptual perspective of what rural tourism is all about. So similar to that, you can have any title uh, that have a this subtitle to give you further explanation of what the main title is all about. So it adds substance uh, to a particular literary or provocative or imaginative title that you have actually put up. So sometimes you want this title to catch someone's attention, but sometimes it doesn't really tell you what is the content. So this subheading or subtitle can actually help to give that uh, kind of explanation. It qualifies uh, the geographic scope of the research. If you're doing a research based on a certain location, then you can say this is a case study based on the experience in Southeast Asia. So it gives you a geographical context. It can also qualify the, the temporal uh, scope of the research. Okay, For instance, let's say if you say, uh, I want to do a comparison of the uh, progressive era and the depression years. What is the societal influence during a period, certain period of time? So that can help you to scope your, your study. It can also focus on uh, investigating uh, a particular idea or particular theory that you want to investigate or you want to compare from. So there's so many ways you can put the subtitle, but remember that the subtitle is basically give you an idea of what the main heading is all about. And sometimes the title, the main title doesn't really explain. And then you have this subheading to help you. Once you are clear with the title, then you can start making an outline of your study. So writing papers uh, requires you to come up with sophisticated, uh, complex, and sometimes even very creative way of, uh, of structuring your ideas. So taking the time to draft uh, an outline can help you see whether your ideas are connect to each other. What uh, order of ideas works best? Uh, where, uh, where are the gaps in your thinking? If it exists or whether you have sufficient evidence uh, to support each of your points. So it's important for you to come up with an outline. So writing the outline uh, helps you to uh, help you to uh, preserve the logic of the, the paper. Okay, it identifies the main ideas, uh, what are the subordinate ideas, or and then to avoid you from going uh, off tangent from what the paper is all about. So this is important. So by having a good outline, you will be uh, much. Uh, less likely to, to get a, a writer's block because an outline will really show uh, you uh, where you are going and what is your next step. Okay, so it will guide you accordingly. It will also help you to stay organized and focused uh, throughout uh, the writing process and also helps you to ensure uh, a proper flow of idea or coherence of your, your final paper. However, the outline uh, should be viewed only as a guide. Okay, it doesn't mean that if it is not within the outline, you, 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 you're not supposed to discuss. It is a guide for you. This outline can change as you write. So a clear and, and detailed outline will ensure that you always have a, a something to help recalibrate your writing. If you feel that, uh, that uh, you're drifting away from the subject area. So, so that's why the outline is important. The outline can also be key to, 
to keeping you motivated because you can put an outline when you're excited about the project and then you, you start putting the outline and start writing it. When sometimes when you open a blank sheet of paper and you start writing it without an outline, then you get stressed because you are not able to come up with the content. But once you come up with the outline and then fill up the parts that you think you have an idea and start putting it in. So an outline will actually help you uh, organize uh, multiple ideas about a topic. So most research problems uh, can be analyzed uh, in any number of uh, interrelated ways. So an outline can help you uh, to sort out which is the be best mode of analysis or the most appropriate or to ensure the most robust finding uh, in the publication. So that is why it is key for you to have an outline. And then you, there's general approaches when you do this outline. One approach is using the uh, topic outline. Okay, So this approach is useful uh, when you are dealing with a number of different issues that could be arranged uh, in a variety or, or different ways in your paper. So due to short phrases, uh, having uh, more content than using simple sentences, this will create a, a, a better content uh, from which to build your, your paper. Short, short phrases, you put it in within the topic outline. Or you can also use some sentence outline. So this approach uh, is useful when your paper focuses on a, a lot of complex issue in details. So the sentence outline that you create uh, will uh, themselves have uh, uh, will allow you to include details that is required uh, for that particular part of the publication. So you can use topic outline or you can use sentence outline. So depending whichever approach that is easy for you. So there are a few steps to make uh, to take when you're making this outline. So, uh, so identifying the research problem. The research problem, if you see here, uh, is key in any publication. We talked about it uh, in our last uh, lesson as well. The research problem is a focal point, a focal uh, point from which uh, the rest of the outline will flow. So try to sum up the point of your paper. Uh, in one sentence or phrase, uh, it also can be a key to deciding what is the title of your paper uh, that you are trying to write about. Secondly, identify uh, the main categories. What uh, main points will you analyze? The introduction will describe uh, all of your main points. The rest of your paper can be spent developing those points. Creating the first category. What is the first uh, point that you want to cover? If the paper centers around a, a complicated term, uh, definition can be a good place to start. So normally you start with the definition. For a paper about a particular theory, giving the general background of the theory can be a good place to begin. So there are ways that you can structure the paper. Next, creating uh, subcategories. So after you have uh, the main point, create points under it that provide uh, support uh, for the main point. The number of categories that you use depend on the amount of information that you are trying to cover. So there is no right or wrong number to use. So all it depends on what is the requirement of the publication and, and what is the page count uh, that is required or the word count that is required for the publication and then you plan it accordingly. So once you have developed the paper, then follow the guidelines that is given for the publication. What are the breakdown of chapters that is required? Okay, whether you need the introduction method, literature review result, and this conclusion in some publication, the result is separate, discussion is separate in some publication. There is no literature review. The literature review is subsumed in the introduction. So it depends. You have to look at the, uh, the requirement of the publication. So there is no rule uh, dictating uh, which uh, approach is the best. So choose either a topic outline or a sentence outline based on which one you believe will work for you. However, once you uh, begin developing an outline, try to stick to it, the approach that you're taking. So both the topic and sentence outlines uh, uh, can be can use uh, Roman and Arabic numerals. So depend, in certain places you see the chapters, they do not number. Some places they use uh, Roman numbering and sometimes they use Arabic numbering to outline the papers. So it is key for you to follow that so that you know the, the flow, which comes first. So the, although the format of an outline uh, may look rigid, uh, it should be flexible in how you want to arrange the paper accordingly. So, uh, so normal, if you look at any publication, the, the standard is about 20 pages, 15, 20 pages, and sometimes more 
the qualitative paper takes a bit more. Uh, the scientific papers are normally very precise and short. So again, as I've said, look at the guideline that is given. The next part here, which uh, before I, I conclude, is the paragraph development. So, so when you start preparing a paper, how you structure your paragraph is key. Okay, when you say paragraph here, what I mean here is a, a group of uh, related sentences uh, that support one main idea. Okay, remember here, the keyword here is one main idea. You don't want to put so many ideas into one paragraph. So in general, a paragraph will consist of, of uh, three parts. The topic sentence, uh, which tells you what your paragraph is all about. Okay, by reading the first line, you already know what is it all about. And then the second is the body sentences. Here is where you talk about uh, concrete details. Okay, the what. Basically, what are you talking about? The what. You're trying to answer the what question here. And then the second part of the body sentences uh, is the commentary or what you call the so what. The interpretation, the opinion and analysis. So that is where you put in your information inside. And then the, the third part of a paragraph will be the concluding. Okay, it can be the concluding or sometimes it is also the bridge or transitional sentence that will connect you to the next paragraph. So don't write a paragraph that is hanging. And then all of a sudden, the next paragraph, paragraph that you have written that has no connection to the earlier paragraph. So there must be some flow of transition when you move from one paragraph to another. So paragraphs will actually show uh, where the subdivision of a research paper will begin and end. And it will help the reader to see the organization of the essay and also to catch the points easily. So paragraphs are the, uh, the building blocks of all papers. So without a well-written paragraph, the flow logic from one idea to the next will be lost. Okay, And if you have a very long paragraph, the same thing can happen. Okay, I'm sure you have seen before. Sometimes you, you see some people who have written publication with one whole page with one paragraph. So, so when you are a reader, you get lost. So it is, remember a paragraph is actually guiding you step by step, point by point, idea by idea. So don't dump everything in one paragraph. So there are many different types of, uh, of uh, paragraph transition that you can use when you are moving from one paragraph to another okay so this is important because uh, if you do not do it right this transition then the paragraph will be affected so there are different types of paragraph as you start uh, looking at you will realize there are some paragraph that is very narrative okay paragraph that that tells you about a scene or event they give you a lot of details and some of it can also be very descriptive paragraph that gives you vivid description of a particular subject it can be very expository where it provides uh, information, okay, general information. And it can also be paragraphs that are very persuasive, okay, trying to convince a particular point or, or, or the readers. So, uh, so paragraphing is delicate uh, art in writing. So, so with little time and, and patience, you will quickly become the pro in writing. So as long as you remember what is the aim of that particular every paragraph that you write in academic uh, publication must have a reason don't write something for the sake of writing so as you move from one paragraph to another as i've said the transition becomes key okay how you begin and how you end so if you are starting a paragraph so these are some of the keywords that you see on the screen here that you will normally use okay for example as well as furthermore consequently additionally this is you're starting, you're actually linking up from the earlier paragraph and then you're continuing. And then in between the sentences, you will also use certain keywords like equally and then because, since. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to find some words to, to pull all the paragraph uh, together. And then lastly here, before I hand over to uh, Fairo Niza, is the paragraph pointers. So paragraphs, uh, remember, uh, uh, allow the readers to pause uh, to assimilate your argument. That is why it is important to keep it precise. If your paragraph is too long, then uh, there is no pause for the reader and hence the reader is going to get lost. So very so your paragraph sentences will vary in terms of length. Okay. Uh, so sometimes you may have slightly longer, sometimes you may have slightly shorter. 
to depending on the contents. But avoid uh, avoid paragraph that is composed of just one sentence. I'm sure you have seen that before in publication where it's one sentence, but it's going on and on and on. And then along the way, you are lost. Okay, so beware of paragraph that run more than uh, longer than one double space uh, manuscript page. So they are hard to read and always hard to follow. So, so break the long paragraph into small, small logical blocks so that everyone can understand. So that is quick. That is a quick uh, overview of why it is important to understand the titling, uh, outlining the paper, and then design your paragraph step by step. So now I shall hand over the next part to Ms. Fironiza in terms of uh, uh, the library support in you uh, uh, in writing your, your, your paper here. Over to you, uh, Fironiza. Okay, thank you, uh, Prof. Vic. So hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, for today's session, I will share with you on how to identify credible resources for your academic writing. As explained by Prof. Vic Nisbordin and Prof. Ryan earlier, you need to give yourself sufficient time to identify, select, and read relevant research literature when you are preparing to write. Depending on your topic, the resources you need may include books from academic publishers, articles from scholarly journals, data and statistics, primary sources, articles from popular publication, government documents, standard images, and so on. So all these resources can be found in the library. So now there are three types of uh, sources. Um, yeah, next up, please, thank you. There are, uh, there are three, no, the, the previous one, please, the type of sources. Thank you. There are three types of sources uh, as listed on the list. There are primary sources, secondary sources, and tertiary sources. For primary sources, it refers to first-hand testimony or direct evidence created by witnesses or recorders who experience the event or condition being documented, created when the event or condition are occurring. Okay, example, uh, diaries, personal letters and correspondence, interview, survey, speeches and oral history, original documents and government documents. Secondary sources refer to uh, analysis or restatement of primary sources. They often try to describe the, and explain the primary sources. Example, uh, journals and magazine articles, news report, encyclopedia, textbooks, and also books that you are using. For tertiary sources, there are sources uh, such as index, abstract, that organize, compile, or digest other sources. Some reference materials, uh, textbook, are considered tertiary resources when their chief purpose is to list, summarize, and also repackage the other information. The cherry resources usually don't credit a particular authors. Next slide, please. Okay, the most well-established way of finding research to support your idea is to use the library. Many libraries have librarians who specialize in particular areas of research and they will be able to help you to find the best resources for your specific topics. Most library contains um, resources such as books, periodicals, full text databases of ebooks and e journals, and also institutional re repositories for their official publication. They also have dictionaries, encyclopedia, newspaper, videos images and sound resources. So for books, most library make finding books easy by indexing them. Uh, you can access it through the online catalog. You should be able to go to the library website by using the simple search that you have learned for your topic. And index will provide the titles, author and other publication information for each book. It will also provide a call number where you can go and look for it on the shelf. The call number uh, serves as an address for the book. Where is it located on the shelf? For periodicals, uh, books are normally very comprehensive, but they take a lot of time and take years to get published. 
this means that the material in the book uh, is often at least uh, need around a year or more. By the time it is published, um, the information is already out of date. So if your topic depends on a more recent type of information, you should turn to periodicals. Periodicals include magazine, newspaper, journals, and other publications. This publication may appear weekly, monthly, um, or quarterly, and it will update the research given in certain fields. So each periodical will offer a variety of articles. So for databases, uh, nowadays there we have a lot of databases out there that offer print uh, instead of uh, accessing print uh, books and also print uh, printed journals. You can access uh, ebooks and e journals through uh, varieties types of uh, databases that uh, provide you full text of journals. Uh, in the previous um, lessons, I have shared with you some of the databases that we have here at WU District Library and also open access databases that you can search for. So it is institutional repository will contain mostly scholarly work of an institution. The collection consists of print of uh, articles or research reports submitted for publishing or journals, articles accepted for publication, conference papers, teaching materials, student projects, and so on. Most of the academic library has its own institutional repositories. Uh, WOU Library has a comprehensive collection of their own publications. Next slide, please. Okay, scholarly sources. The most important characteristic of scholarly sources is it is written by or for specific by spe specialized expert in a particular field. Okay. Publication include detailed information about the author. Articles must go through a peer review process before they're accepted for publication. Peer review meaning that it has gone through an evaluation process by others who are expert in the same field and is considered necessary to ensure the academic or scientific quality of it. It will normally include full citation and sources. So it's very important for you to understand that this type of sources is very credible and it is a source that has been peer reviewed and mostly when we do research, we recommend it that the students and also researchers use a lot of scholarly sources. Next slide, please. Okay, these are examples of uh, scholarly sources that, has, that is available for you to access. Okay, next slide, please. Popular sources. Okay, popular sources. Uh, you must understand that it is it has not gone through the peer review process. It is written by journalists or professional writers for general audience, those who are an expert in the subject or field. It uses language that is easily understood by general readers and is written for the public to use. So these resources are also available for you to use, but it will be depending on uh, the, the type of information that you are looking for. If you're looking for more statistical research type of information, so you will mostly have to use the scholarly resources, but you can also use popular sources if you need the information that is available or related to your topic, but you have to remember that you have to check and evaluate the information before you use it. Next slide, please. Okay, this is an example of a general magazine or popular sources. Next slide, please. All right, to find all these uh, credible resources, there are a lot of ways that you can use. So there's a few methods such as Subject searches. Normally, subject searches will use subject heading. Okay, there are specific terms or phrases that use consistently by online or print indexes to describe what a book or journal article is about. So you can use subject as a uh, search method for you to find uh, credible resources related to your topic. You can also look for recent scholarly books and articles. 
within the catalogs and databases. You can sort the most recent date and look for books from scholarly presses and articles. The most recent the source, the more up to date the reference and citation. So by using that, you can get or be directed to the latest books and articles. Citation searches is a scholar resources, so you can track down references, footnotes, and notes, citation, and so on within the relevant reading that you need for your topic. So you can also search through published bibliographies. Okay. So you can look at published bibliographies on a particular subject and often the list of sources that uh, will miss through the kind, this kind of searches. So if you want to make sure that you cover all the credible resources, so you search through the published bibliography. So you look through the, the, the section where they list out all the bibliographies so you can go through from that to find the resources that you need for your topic. Next slide, please. Okay, citation styles. There are hundreds and different referencing styles from which you can choose. Okay, uh, the listed citation style are commonly used. You just need to refer to the specific style guide when you write your reference or citations. So the link, there's a link uh, where you can go to the website that give you more information about how to write citation styles. It's a guide for the citation styles. Next slide, please. Okay, there's also a lot of citation citation tools available for you to use. Okay, there's a lot of uh, library databases that allows you to create citations. So for example, the one that we have here at listed and the OAU library is Expohost. So when you use the Expohost database, they also give you uh, allows you to create citations depending on uh, a different format. So you can choose, it's already uh, created for you. You can just select which one that you need to uh, use for your research, depending on the format that you have chosen, the format of stuff. Okay, the others are like Mendeley, Zotero, and citation machines. All these are free citation generator for different types of citation styles. So the list given to you, uh, you can go to the link and have a look at it and uh, try to use it. Okay, next slide please. Okay, we also have uh, listed for you resources available from uh, online resources and websites related to the topic. So you can go through the website and uh, have a look at all the resources and guidance. Okay, thank you. I hope you are able to, to get uh, some uh, new information and the library is always available for you to help you to find any articles or books that you are unable to search. So we will try to, to, to search for you and see if, if it's not available at the library, we will source out and try to get it for you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Faruniza, for giving us good overview in terms of uh, the library support and also uh, how we can use library to, to actually structure a paper and find the, the correct uh, resources that you, you have discussed today. So now I'm going to open the floor uh, for question. Uh, I think there's one question here. Uh, maybe this is directly directing to Ms. Fairuniza. Is Mendeley software a free subscription software? Sorry. The, the one that I listed is a free guidance. So actually, the, there's also a software that uh, you, some of the features, if you want to use the full features, you have to actually subscribe to it. But the link, link that I provide is, is, is a free link where you can get a lot of guidance and also help you to generate a simple, um, what do you call this, uh, citation styles for you. Yeah, but I think even in uh, even in the Microsoft Word now, uh, there is a, there is a, a a tool within Microsoft Word for you to actually do a citation. So it, I think yes. within Microsoft Word there is already some help given, uh, unlike before where you need a, a Mendeley and uh, they had another one which is more popular yeah. one. Uh, um, can't remember the name also. In not. Yes. EndNote. Yes. EndNote. Yes. That's the most popular one. Uh, it's quite expensive, but now I think they've made it easier within Word 
to actually help you with the citation because doing referencing and citation uh, can be very tedious if you need to change from the requirement of one journal to another. So it can be a very tedious process if you're doing it manually. But with the application, it's just uh, at a click of a mouse, uh, it changes accordingly and, and do it rightly. So it's always good to use tools to help you when you are doing your citations and, and referencing. I'm not sure what's happening with my camera. It's also now not working, but anyway, um, the, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Uh, the other thing with, with these, these uh, referencing or bibliography tools, you can choose one, I know EndNote does this, where you can actually save the article. So you can actually download the article from the database and save it in there, which is really good if for your career development. So if you then go on to change institutions and your access to database changes, you can take the article with you, right? So I, so I, I, I did that and I found it very, very useful. As I said, it's well worth doing this. It takes a bit of investing time out to learn, but it helps you develop a stream of research. Yeah. Right? So, um, that is important for your future. So is there any other question for the rest? Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute everyone. So you are, you are free to speak, unmute yourself. If you have a question, uh, if you have faced certain challenges, maybe some of you are, are working on a publication or working to finish your master's or even your, your, your PhD or doctoral. Uh, so maybe is, if you have a question that you, you want to ask, you can. I, I see there's a question in the chat. May I know which website is it? Just to mention just now, my line is kind of down. Uh, I'm not sure which, uh, what, yeah, so Leong Jiu Yun, maybe you want to unmute yourself and explain the referencing website. Oh, okay. Uh, it's a tool rather than a website, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but Mandalay, I, I, I would type Mandalay in um, in the uh, comment section for you for the spelling of it. So, so, it, so in fact, the, the slides that we just presented, I think, uh, Fairo Reza, you have actually provided the link. Uh, on the slide itself. So when you get the slide, you can just click on the word, uh, the links there, and it will automatically take you to the, the correct website, the Mendeley website, the Zotero website, citation machine. It's all, the hyperlink is already provided in the slides. So we will actually provide you the, the slides so that you can actually click on it and then uh, it takes you to the correct uh, website. Okay, uh, any more questions from the rest? Anybody working on a publication and they're, they're struggling and they need some help? Um, I mean, maybe you are, are you are coming up with a few ideas and you want to thrash that around, or you actually, you've already done that and you don't know what to do next. And then I think a, a good thing to do is actually um, present or, or at least have a sharing session. I think, and when I said you must present to others, you don't have to necessarily have a formal presentation. You can just come with an idea and then, okay, share over lunch or something. Okay, um, yeah. okay, this is what I'm thinking. What do you guys think? How do we pro uh, progress? Can be quite informal. Okay, um, someone says they're stuck at literature review. Oh well. <laughs> okay, so, uh, I guess it, so. Um, I mean, we're all in different fields, but we can still share. Right, so, so if you come along with a structure, um, we, we were talking about before in terms of writing style, okay, and then uh, we can see the is, is a logical flow there, all right, without even being expert in, in your respective field. I think anyone can, yeah. yeah. I think normally, normally, if you're stuck at literature review, uh, it boils down to, to what we've discussed in our last lesson whether your topic is too broad or whether your topic is too narrow. When it's too broad. You have so much of information that you don't know how to condense it further. It's like every single article seems to be useful for you. Then you know you're 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 too broad. But if you're too narrow, then you have a problem of you are not able to get anything that is related uh, to the problem that you're trying to solve. So literature review is key. Uh, so normally, uh, in my own experience, uh, supervising uh, masters and PhD student. Uh, uh, normally, you will send the student away. So when I get a new student, I'll tell, okay, I, I, I don't want to see you for the next three to six months. 
you're going to read all the literature. You need to read at least 1,000 articles or 500 articles on your topic. Then you decide on what is the scope. Uh, so it is a tough process, but it is an important process. Literature review is key because you don't want to be obsolete in the research that you are actually working on. You don't want an expert to come and say, hey, you have missed out some landmark uh, publication in your in your article. So then they immediately they know that your article uh, is not comprehensive enough. So that's another question. I think Prof Vic, we are actually going to cover literature review later, is that right? Yes, correct. There's a topic on literature review, which we'll, we, will, we will go much deeper when we come to literature review. I, because I think there's an issue which is, may sort of relate to the, uh, what Leong and Jiao Yun is saying, in that there is a, an efficient way to read articles too, right? Yes. I'll touch on later, but just just briefly for your to, to answer you in the meantime, we're going to order. Um, what I find obviously you search by title mostly, right? Or keywords in the title, but you can search the keywords in, in the abstract and so on. But um, but how I find it is that I read the abstract, I read the maybe the, uh, the first paragraph of the introduction. I have a look at the methodology to see if it's credible research. Obviously, I'm only looking. Uh, credible journals, and which comes with knowledge. Uh, 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 being older in the field level, um, uh, I get to know what's good journal, what's not such a good journal. And then I look at the conclusion. And then I put, is this a journal I wish to read further, right? And, and I put it aside and I continue my search and I, and I read. And then you can also find, uh, by the way, uh, look at look for articles which give you literature reviews. Okay, but we'll talk a little bit about some of uh, later. So, 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 so uh, just a short answer to Leong Jia Yun's question. Okay, look for good literature reviews which are published in uh, recent journals which are credible. Okay, that would be a good starting point. There's another question here on how to define whether is the book or document is relevant uh, to our research. That's what I was sort of saying. Let's say. yeah. So it, it is it is difficult, uh, but as part of your research, uh, yeah, firstly you you have to set your your boundaries. Uh, basically, remember when you do your research, uh, your, your guiding principle is the problem statement and your research question. What are you trying to address? So once that is very clear, then it becomes easy for you to find. If you just have a a general title uh, which has no link to a uh, a research question, the tendency is you tend to take everything that comes out when you do a search in that title and sometimes it may be totally irrelevant. As what uh, Prof. Ryan mentioned, it is key for you to find information in, in good journals as well. Because if you get, uh, uh, if you use references that or publication that is uh, not reputable, sometimes uh, it can also impact the quality of your, of your writing. So normally, my own process is once I find a good article from a particular journal that I want, as what uh, Prof. Brian mentioned, look at the reference uh, that used in that particular uh, journal, that particular article, and then based on that article, you find the article that's supporting. So normally, if you have one solid article, you can generate more articles because you just look at the reference from one article, then that will link you to another article then you look at the reference again again and again and you will actually find uh, all the articles that is uh, required especially for a particular topic because remember especially for those of you who are planning to to go for your phd defense or, or working on your thesis uh, examiners will always look at landmark articles on that particular field so once you are if you are not identifying or you have not discussed a particular landmark article, the probability is then the reader will say that this particular uh, researcher has not been thorough in the study. So they will brush off the particular article. So it's very key for you to ensure that you have actually covered the breadth and also the depth in that particular area. Okay. Um, if there is no further question, the time is now uh, 3.34. We are four minutes uh, out of our promised time. So thank you once again to uh, Prof. Brian and Pyro Niza for, 
for another excellent session and we will continuously uh, uh, follow through with this session in, in the next two weeks for the next part of the section which is actually focusing on abstract which Prof. Brian briefly mentioned that he, he reads the abstract first which is key so how do you write a good abstract so that is what we're going to be covering in our next lesson so don't forget please register for the session if you have missed out any of the session no worries it's all recorded as long as you're registered you will get the link of the recording and also the copy of the presentation so once again thank you to everyone and stay safe and we will see you again in two weeks from today bye-bye goodbye everyone thank you